There is some promise in the idea of the curator as jester. So the curator is an embodiment of license, albeit officially sanctioned irresponsibility. In today's highly professionalized art world, the notion of the curator as fool is comically subversive. These connotations of romantic anti-authoritarianism are largely fanciful ones, but the related notion of the curator as storyteller, or of a responsible storyteller, seems to put us in the position of authority again, without promise. Is the storytelling curator an authority, an author? What kind of subject does this curator hope to encounter? A listener? An audience? Perhaps in the era of participation, we might prefer the curator as storyteller to encounter collaborators in the construction of stories. A reader who, as Rontier puts it, is a poet in the act of reading. In considering the curator as jester or storyteller, I'm faced with the question of interpretation of the curator as jester reinterpreting the world mischievously, perhaps, or as storyteller as interpreting the world or the selected works, and simultaneously as presenting works and the unity of those works in a given display for interpretation. We can regard interpretation, however, in two ways, as the question of constructing meaning or of constructing readers, interpreters. I want to focus on the latter. Jean-Jacques Lesseur connects questions about interpretation to questions about the author and of the reader, or spectator, or we might say the interpreter. The two individuals and the work are inextricably linked, bound together as elements of a single whole. The work, both physically and semiotically, mediates between the two subjects, not simply insofar as they encounter the same object differently, but as a transaction between the two subjects, through an object, whether that's an artwork or a combination of artworks in an exhibition. Rather than thinking of the author or reader either as empirical subjects or as fictions, Lesser traces a circuit of relations in which the reader and author are places that can be occupied temporarily by various individuals. This is drawn from Grimas's semantic theory of narrative, in which the characters and events are understood as conforming to a grammar. Within the grammar of narrative, characters are re-described by Grimas in terms, of, in terms of the actants that they embody. As Tans Hawkes puts it, the deep structure of the narrative generates and defines its actants at a level beyond that of the story's surface content. The CERT transposes the grammar of narratives to the social relations of reading and writing of author and reader, in which the real subjects of the process are not the individual agents, the real and concrete men and women engaged in it, but the relations of production that define and distribute those places. The author, the curator, the storyteller, the reader, the artist, the spectator, the participant, the viewer, the gesture, the jester, that's the second time that's happened today, are all functions of the work and the circuits through which the work flows. The reader or spectator is captured at a place designated by the text the artwork or the exhibition. And so is the artist or author or curator that produces that work. This is the subject constructed or interpolated by that which they feel to be interpreting or constructing themselves. The interpolated reader, although subjected as much as subjectified, subjectified, is not powerless. She sends back the force of interpolation. Author and reader are paired actors so that each author has its own reader, and each reader has its own author. The multiplicity of authors or artists is not independent of the multiplicity of readers and spectators. They are tied together. This means that the so-called death of the author can only be achieved with an utter transformation of text and artworks and of the circuits through which these texts flow. The transformation of the reader or spectator, for instance, into a participant or a collaborator, must also occur within the work and within the circuits through which works flow, or else no transformation takes place. 
Thus, all the the theoretical and practical attention to the viewer, or spectator, or participant these days will come to nothing if it remains a separate concern as an add-on to the work, like holding a picnic in front of an unreconstructed artwork in the hope of allowing the viewer to be more convivial. Le Cirque goes further than this. The actants of art and literature are not fixed but continually renegotiated. And the relations between them change too. This is the circle. What we need is a model that combines asymmetry in the positions of author and reader, that is, they don't just become the same, in that the two moments our acts of reading and writing are constitutively separated, and symmetry at the same time in both actors, although not at, not at the same time, are symmetrically interpolated in their respectful, respective accidental sites. I know that's complicated. It gets clearer. Le Cirque argues we have a pantomime of actants in which each fantasizes about the others and about themselves. The author cannot write without a fantasy of a reader. The reader has a fantasy about the writer. And reading involves constructing the fantasy of you as a reader. And writing involves the fantasy of you as a writer. If the reader it, uh, is a creation of the author, the author himself is nothing but a fantasy of the reader. That's what I say. What's more, every author is also a reader who fantasizes about other authors and about the author that they wish to be. Le Cirque, I want to argue, provides us with the materials to rethink the spectator in a way that eludes Jacques Rancière in his book, The Emancipated Spectator. At the heart of this book is an opposition between the concept of the emancipated spectator and the concept of the passive and ignorant spectator. One he likes, the other he doesn't like, and guess what? This is an impoverished opposition. I'm going to propose instead that we regard the art goer as neither emancipated nor passive and ignorant, but always and necessarily impossible. And I mean impossible in the way that every utopian, progressive and radical idea is impossible. The impossible spectator is the only spectator worth talking about. And since all art actants are configured grammatically in this way, the same is true of the artist, the curator, the jester and the storyteller. Which is to say, the only ones worth thinking about would be the impossible artist, the impossible curator, the impossible jester, and the impossible storyteller. It is worth noting in passing that the emancipated spectator and the passive and ignorant spectator have something in common that is absent from the impossible spectator. Rancière argues that the avant-garde actually treated the spectator as passive and ignorant, and he argues at the same time that the spectator is actually already emancipated. Following the Cirque, however, we can see that both the emancipated spectator and the passive and ignorant spectator are therefore empirical, real, actual, not actants, not fantasies. The impossible spectator then is not empirical, but is a place that can be occupied, albeit temporarily. But let's go back to Rons here for a second. He diagnoses what, what he thinks of as the problem in this way. According to the accusers, being a spectator is a bad thing for two reasons. First, viewing is the opposite of knowing. The spectator is held before an appearance in a state of ignorance about the process of production of this appearance and about the reality it conceals. Second, it is the opposite of acting. The spectator remains immobile, in her seat, passive. To be a spectator is to be separated from both the capacity to know and the power to act. What Rancière detects in this critical discourse of the spectator, reapplying his argument from the ignorant schoolmaster, is what he calls a structure of domination and subjection, which he calls the logic of the stultifying pedagogue, the logic of straight, uniform transmission. So we're back to interpretation again. Just as the pupil is dominated and subjected by the very act of attempting to overcome her ignorance by the knowledgeable teacher, and is emancipated, rather, by the ignorant teacher who does not teach his pupils his knowledge but orders them to venture into the forest of things and signs. 
the spectator is dominated and subjected by the very act of attempting to overcome their passivity and ignorance. Against this, Rancière insists, the incapable are capable. So for Rancière, just as the pupil should not be subjected to the stultifying transmission of the knowledge of the schoolmaster, and just as the pupil must always enter the relationship with the schoolmaster as someone who knows not, as it is presumed by the schoolmaster, as someone without any knowledge at all, the spectator is always active and intelligent. Rancière is challenging the actance of pedagogy with the actuality of real concrete individuals, pupils who actually know things. He wants to do the same for our spectators. Already active and intelligent, the avant-gardist has no responsibility to make the spectator active and intelligent, and no right to wake them up or to shock them into activity. Although Rancière's politics takes sides with the systematically impoverished, excluded and denigrated, when it comes to the question of cultural politics, he takes sides with that hegemonic subject, the spectator, rather than culture's impoverished, excluded and denigrated subject, the Philistine. The Philistine is not the actual embodiment of exclusion, but a place produced by a structure. It therefore has only a structural promise, not an empirical one. And this uh, connects it with the Marxist concept of the proletariat. Marx did not argue that the working class were in fact better educated, had better manners, or were better equipped to govern than the bourgeoisie. And no defence of the Philistine could get very far by starting from the assertion that it is culturally superior to the aesthetes or the connoisseur. <coughs> in fact, there is nothing positive about the Philistine that would justify any hope placed in it. Like the proletariat in the economy, the Philistine holds a unique place within the totality, which means that it is a powerful agent nonetheless. It holds a specific place. The Philistine is the repository of hope, not because of how we might judge particular Philistine attitudes, or those we might identify as actual Philistines, but because it holds the place of all those without a place in the conflictual arena of culture. So with the Philistine, the modernist, the avant-gardist, and the critical or political or revolutionary artist in mind, let me return to Rancière's argument that the incapable are capable, the basis of his defense of the spectator as having no need for emancipation, since the spectator is already emancipated. What he calls the adventure of critical thought has always insisted, he says, um, on this waking up, on the ignorance and um, and passivity of the spectator. But what we can see by looking at the history of the avant-garde is that it's also always insisted, not only on the capacity of the incapable, um, but on their critical capacity. And this is a very important difference, it seems to me. The incapable, those Philistines who prefer the circus to the art gallery, those primitives who are closer to violence and civilization, those pamphleteers who are closer to action and aesthetic contemplation are capable of shattering the aesthetic world of official culture. But what the critical tradition with art also adds to the argument that the incapable are capable is that the capable are incapable. I mean, the lovers of official culture are too well educated to see, for instance, the subtleties of low culture, to see that, the, that critical art is, uh, is nuanced. The incapable are capable, but this doesn't go far enough. The capable are incapable. This is why the cultivated so often reject the works of the avant-garde. They are incapable in their current place to see it. What's more, we can add two further twists to Rancière's assertion that the incapable are capable. First, the capacity of the capable, their skills, tastes and pleasures, should not be thought of as capacity as such. It should not therefore go unchallenged and should not be seen as the best way to judge the incapable. And second, the capacity of the incapable to engage in art is not their only capacity. The capacity to engage seriously with art, for instance, should not be seen as the horizon, as something for the incapable to aspire to, as their only power. The capacity of the incapable is not their limit, the incapable have, if you like, excess capacity. 
they can do, see, and think things that the capable cannot. Rancière, however, only allows Philistines to aspire to official culture, but not to challenge, subvert, and question it. The emancipated spectator is, if you like, a good citizen of art, well behaved, at ease, legitimate, untroubled, unquestioning, follows protocol, knows what is expected of them, knows their place, and enjoys it. Art has more to offer than this, partly because it asks more of the spectator than to be good, than to have capacity for it. Art wants, I think, an impossible spectator. Let us see the spectator not as an empirical individual, opposed to the artist, set against each other in an antagonistic, an antagonistic relationship, as Ronty had it. Let's see them instead as actants or places integral to the work. A person does not occupy one place permanently. For empirical reasons, of course, we have to see the artist as also unnecessarily a spectator. We go to galleries. But in terms of the grammar of art relations, the artist is also a spectator in another sense. Real, concrete individuals temporarily occupy the places set by the work in its circuits. As such, Rancière's politics of art, which presupposes a conflict between the different empirical figures fixed in their roles of artist and spectator, can be replaced with the politics of art's impossible spectators, impossible artists, impossible curators, impossible storytellers, and impossible listeners. In effect, when an artist creates a work that establishes a new place for the engagement with art, they are proposing a place for themselves to occupy, both as an impossible artist and potentially an impossible spectator. Making art in this sense should always be an act of self-transformation, curating to. This is in fact what artists as spectators want from other artists, and it's what artists want from curators. We go to galleries in order to be stretched, in order to find new ways of thinking and being, in order to occupy new places in the grammar of art. The point is not to keep art from everyone else, to think of art's grammar only in terms of artists as artists and artists as spectators. The point is first to do away with Rancière's fatal partitioning of the art world that keeps artists and spectators apart in their fixed roles, failing to see how these places can be occupied by the same individuals. The point is also to build into the heart of the grammar of art social relations those places that do not yet exist, but are the reason why art continues to be an exhilarating experience. The spectator should not come to rest in the encounter with art, but should be sent off, transported, transposed and transformed. <coughs> art in this way always hopes for and tries to produce a new spectator, a spectator that was previously impossible. The spectator is not meant to be capable, at least not straight away, and if so, not for long, but needs to engage in a kind of creative labour which is as much about transforming oneself as it, as it is about knowing the work, of negotiating the places constructed by the work or the exhibition or the event, of transforming oneself so as to occupy the place of the actant, and performatively to transpose the actant by occupying its place subversively, playfully, creatively, and foolishly. The labour of engaging with art is a labour of transformation from the possible to the impossible. Not in terms of knowledge, not in terms of interpretation, but in terms of subjectivity, of a becoming. Art allows us to become something unpredictable, something unacceptable, something strange. The impossible spectator is constantly changing because they must continue to outstrip their own capacity. Their capacity keeps running out. They are not capable once and for all, but are continually stretched by the experience of art. Not by the shocking artwork or the shocking artist, but by the process of engaging with art. Capacity is dead. Capacity is facile. Incapacity is joy. So the avant-garde, instead of emancipating the, the spectator from passivity and ignorance, can best be seen as establishing places for impossible spectators to occupy. To address the spectator to come, to therefore see our spectators as capable of, well, above all else, to become something impossible. Finally, the impossible spectator is a mobile subject that holds another promise. Following Walter Benjamin's argument in Arthur as producer that the distinction between those who write and those who read can and ought to be abandoned, the impossible spectator is someone who is not restricted to being a spectator, as if this were their fate. 
The impossible spectator is a temporary spectator, an actant, always ready to take on a different role, participant, author, collaborator. Without this kind of mobility, there is no emancipation. The various possible roles available to us are performed by the spectator in a way that refutes the possible, the actual and the empirical, and points beyond their own personal transformation. The impossible spectator promises, promises us an impossible world. The first thing I think is that um, in a very, very, since you're talking about being empirical and being in this world, in a very clear, practical sense, I think it means that the curator doesn't have to do any market research to find out mm -hmm. what kind of audience that they've actually got yeah. and, and play to that. You don't have to uh, imagine that your that, that your responsibility is to um, is to confirm the empirical spectator as they are. So it's kind of it brings a kind of license, which is why I'm interested in, in the, the original proposal of this the gesture as having this kind of license. Um, to in a sense say the impossible, to say what's not possible for other people to say. Um, but it's, it's also, I think, um, as well as not just thinking about the spectator, but also thinking about the impossible curator, mm. of thinking about maybe um, not having to, um, not having to be correct. You know, one, 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 of, one of my, one of my favourite quotes is from Adam Phillips, who says, to do things um, to do things proper is to not do things differently. Mm -hmm. And so the, the impossible curator is someone who's constantly thinking about how not to be proper, not to be right, not to be correct, but to maybe transform ourselves through the process of curating. So that would be the beginning of something like that. Great. Um, do we have, a, there's a lady over there, um, the straight top. Do you need I'm um, sort of following on a bit from Tom's question. Um, I th I'm, it's very sort of seductive, I think, what you're suggesting. And I think as a curator, I'd love to occupy that position. Um, and I'd love to think that the visitors and spectators that, that see the exhibitions that I work on are able to feel that emancipated. But I'm, I'm aware, and you mentioned sort of structure, but I'm just aware of the fact that we do occupy these structures, you know, and that there are certain kind of institutional parameters that come into play whether they're imaginary or real. And I'm wondering how you would, you know, what you think is possible given that, you know, in a practical sense for both the spectator and the curator to, to both take account of those structures and then also find this position that you're suggesting is possible or impossible, as you said. Yeah, and, and these, I call it the impossible spectator and the, the impossible curator for a reason, because Kind of is impossible. <laughs> you know, I, I, think, I, I don't mean that metaphorically. I don't mean that as in a kind of, you know, grandiose kind of melodramatic kind of way. I actually think that uh, the things that we want to achieve, uh, if we if we've got any any sense of emancipation uh, of a project, are literally impossible to do within the current situation. Um, and so, in a sense, we, we kind of need to, um, as well as working within the institutions that we've got, I think we actually need new institutions, which will, which, which will then allow new kinds of possibilities. So, um, well, it depends, it depends what kind of thing you want to emancipate. It, can, it depends on what, what, what you're trying to uh, alter, what you're trying to, uh, to move away from. So, uh, it, my 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 dream of the of, of this kind of flourishing of the impossible, it would be that it would go in in every direction at all at the same time. So, um, it's not that I've got a particular kind of um, bugbear or something that I think you know the impossible curator should be doing this. You know, I, I, I haven't got any kind of preordained idea about what they should do. I just think that it, that it's you know to to kind of to paraphrase Althus out talking about good teachers. You know, the heroism is doing what the structure of the school tells you not to do. Does the impossible spectator not allude to the monolithic um, as a universality of 
spectatorship. The impossible spectator is monolithic. I don't lose to it. I, well, I, I, don't, I don't intend it to be, and I don't hear it in what I'm saying, so I don't, I, I don't know how to answer that really, because I, it doesn't, doesn't relate to anything that I'm thinking about.
which, which, uh, which are not necessarily fixed, in order to transform them, we have to change the world that we're in. That's, that's, so it's not that there's a fixed relationship between the artwork and the subject, it's that changing the subject doesn't occur only within subjectivity, it occurs within the world. And for us, as, as people in the art world, it occurs in the production of artworks, in the production of exhibitions, in the production of <coughs> galleries, museums, and, and, and all the other things that we do. On, on the one hand, I think that um, it's, it's kind of built into um, the way that the art world works anyway, in the sense that, like I was saying, as, as an artist going to an art gallery, you, you want to be stretched. And, and in fact, you sort of, um, you sort of hope not to know where you are, hope not to um, be able to navigate this so easily. Um, so, it's kind of disappointing when you go to an exhibition and it all makes sense. And, and maybe a, 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 as an artist that happens too often. Um, but I think what, what tends to happen to me, and I don't know whether this is general, is you go to an exhibition and you may be, you don't come out there thinking, that's what I want, that works, that, that's now transformed me. I think what, what happens is you go to an exhibition and there's maybe some part of it that has made a difference. Um, and it, it might take a while for it to add up, if you like. Um, so that there isn't a kind of instant uh, out, outcome to that experience. Um, so I, 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 it's probably fact fragmentary as well, rather than saying that whole show somehow was put together in, in a way that, um, that enabled this transformation. I think maybe there'll be maybe certain things that occurred within it that, um, um, that do that. So, um, Like when I went to see the, what's it called? Um, it was, it was, it was um, Duchamp Picabia and, I can't remember, what's it? Man Ray. Man Ray at, the, at Tate. It's kind of, as a whole, the show was, to me, quite disappointing. But there were a few, um, a few things, a, a few combinations in that exhibition that made me stop and think a little bit and to, and to wonder whether I um, understood things correctly before the show. Um, and so I, I left there, first of all, <coughs> utterly disappointed with the whole exhibition, that it didn't do what I would have wanted it to do. But then, on reflection, starting to think about how uh, I maybe needed to go back and rethink some things. So, in, in one sense, it's a very uh, common experience, and in another sense, a very rare experience. Because it's the rare bit within the common experience, I think, that where, where, where it happens. And maybe in an unpredictable, incalculable kind of way as well. Maybe the, that, the bits that matter to me, the kids that have even known had happened. You know? So, it's not. Um, I don't think it's about having a, having a, a formula for putting on exhibitions that's going to do this. Okay, um, the lady at the back there. Yeah. to be um, <laughs> has a potential to be challenging um, and to and to to re-engage 
uh, people um, with art and with place. Um, but I think most of the time, uh, public art is um, is dominated by what, what, what we might call the necessary, which is to say that funders, um, local politicians, and so on and so forth, they all know in advance what they want this thing to do, uh, and so then by the time the work gets in commission, it's already sewn up. So everything's already necessary. And it's very difficult in that situation, most of the time, to produce something impossible. So, it, but I think that there, there are more and more kind of maybe smaller um, and more independent organisations that are working towards uh, making public art a much more vital, dynamic, uh, and transformative kind of practice. So, uh, I think we're in a period of transition, really, in terms of public art, going from something that was like very similar to something that is that is um, um, that's learning to be impossible. I mean, could you give us some examples of organisations? I always find it quite interesting to so okay. I mean, point to particular projects that are sort of interested in. Sure. Um, there was um, there was a project in the collective gallery called the One Mile Project. And, um, and so this was, if you like, this was like a, it kind of structured a little bit like an artist residency. Mm -hmm. And so within, within an institution that, that's not really geared towards public art, they set up this project to commission artists to work publicly in various ways, not necessarily through the production of monuments or something, but, but through a whole range of different ways, depending on the the agenda of those artists. So, the, so the One Mile project was was um, um, like an experiment, really, on on how we might uh, think about public art differently and might engage with publics differently, and so on and so forth. And I'm not picking that out as, as being especially good. It's just that it's a, it's a kind of typical example of how um, people are addressing issues to do with public art. Um, maybe outside of the traditional institutions of public art and outside of the traditional practices of public art. So it's, I think it, it spreads right across. I think that's just, that's just what it's been done. Yeah, there are gentlemen there. Sure. Um, with the right new shirt. Would you say that the, the hot chestnut man kind of uh, summarises some of the things you've been talking about? You mean the guy outside the British Museum? Yeah. <coughs> but you, I, 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 well, well, well I, I, <laughs> sorry, I, I, thought, I thought you were the hot chestnut man. Oh, I'm not the hot chestnut man. Oh, right. Right. Um, when he, <laughs> he saw, <laughs> can you, can you tell us I've got, I've got the name done. Now, 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 now I'm going to look silly, but, but he, he, he asked people to to go and talk, basically, and uh, he got into trouble with the police, and he got into uh, conversations with people about what it meant to burn books. And it seems to me that there he was actually engaging with people, real people, passing. And uh, the, the, what, the kind of thing you're talking about in terms of the impossible spectator could have actually turned up and burnt a book and kind of realised something of what you're talking about. And here is, uh, there's a kind of business of being there, which is also uh, seems to be to engage with, with possibilities and impossibilities. And he kind of fractured something, that's all. Yeah. Um, I think I think when one of the things that artists do at the moment, which is which I find interesting, is of creating um, quite defined scenarios in which in which someone is being invited to do something very specific, like come here and burn this or. Um, you know, turn up with such and such and we'll do this with it and so on. And, and what I find um, interesting about those practices is that the thing that you're being asked to do is not what we've been traditionally asked to do in encountering art. So, that, so there's the potential within those things for us to do new things. Do you see what I mean? And that, so, so that would be where I kind of connect with it. I actually, I, I, I actually was, was asked if I would, because I was given a paper and I was asked if I would burn my paper on the way out. 
And I said, absolutely no. So I, I'm not. I'm not kind of. It seems to me like a kind of um, like a nihilist gesture. Uh, I'd be much more interested in photocopying the paper and handing it out than burning it. So I'm more interested in discourse than I am in a, in that kind of nihilism. Yeah, I kind of saw it as discourse. Oh, well, maybe there's discourse there, around. There, there. I mean, yeah. inherently, what you're saying is all these possibilities. So it, essentially, it's almost impossible to take a position. It's only possible to take a relative position. Well, not, not for me. I hardly ever take relative positions. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got time for the next week for one more question, and then if we have some supplementary questions, um, it's about to be addressed today, both at lunch or at the end of the day. So the lady there. Um, when an artist creates a piece of work without a curator and forms it out of the box, if you like, it's an impossible act, uh, or is it? Does that work of art exist? Um, does it need a curator to um, mediate? What happens? It's interesting, isn't it? I, I was talking to a student yesterday who is um, putting on her degree show, and she's been in lots of shows before, um, but always with a curator. And now she's got to put on a show without one. Um, so she was kind of like, how do you do that? You know? And I was saying, because I'm, I'm quite old now, I was saying, you know, I, I put on lots of shows without curators for most of my life. And it was it's only quite recently that the curators have come in and said, you know, we know how to do this, and we can help you to do this, and so on. So, actually, for most of the history of art, the curators haven't been there to do that job. You know? So, it's not been necessary, and they've not been, um, they've not secured the work as art, on our behalf, and so forth. Um, so, it's, um, it's a, it, we find ourselves in a very interesting old situation, I think, with the, with the curator um, in this position that they're in now. Um, but it's, it might not be true, you know, we'll just have to wait and see. Right, thank you very much, Dave.